Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. And for the benefit of the people at home, may I say that in doing a show like this, we have an audience of 300 people who sit out there, and they laugh, or they don't laugh, and they enjoy the show. I'd also like to remind the people who are sitting there that there is no smoking allowed. <laughs> They're not allowed to bring drink into the studio either. It's ginger ale this week. If he what he gives to you one week, he'll take away the next. <laughs> I'm asked, when I'm working on television, how I know which camera to look at. And all television cameras have, at the top of them, a little red light, which tells me that that's the camera to look at. And if I'm looking at that one and the light goes to that one, I know because of the red light. And if it goes over to that one there, that one there. <laughs> but there are times, actually, there are times when you're doing that, uh, that the director or the performer can either be a little bit ahead or behind one another. And it gets a bit in, because you're chatting, but, and, and it's over here, and good evening, and how are you? <laughs> And you finish up looking like this. <laughs> Actually, the only man in England who can work to three cameras at once is Marty Feldman. <laughs> <laughs> people, they, they ask me too, they say, how do people manage in dr dramatic scenes to bring tears to their eyes? Do How can actors turn on tears? Have you ever noticed when they are about to cry, they all go, <laughs> <laughs> and they come back and there's tears running out of their eyes. They've been pulling the hairs out of the nose. <laughs> I don't do that. I do it. I enjoy it. So I don't do it. <laughs> Look, oh. <laughs> ah, well, no matter. I must admit, I do like a booze. I don't drink a great deal. I really don't. People think, because I talk about it, that I drink. Get off! Get off! Mm, God! <laughs> and you might notice, actually, as I sit, um, I do hold a glass, not around the edge. I hold it with my finger on the inside. It's safer. I used to hold it with that one there. <laughs> it was a strong drink. It's very difficult to drink nowadays. Two fellows chatting, one says, what, what, is, what is the thing they call a breathalyzer? He says, it's the bag that can tell how much you drank. He said, I married one of those bloody things. Here. <laughs> I got picked up, stopped, and I don't know about you, but I refuse to suffer the ignominy of standing in the middle of the night in the rain, blowing into a bag. I wouldn't do it. I couldn't find my mouth. <laughs> And I am not masochistic enough to have them sticking needles in me, drawing my blood off. And there's only one other way to test whether I have alcohol in my bloodstream. And I did what they asked me to do. And I sat there and I waited, and then after a while he came back. And I said, well, what about it? He said, it is 98.2 alcohol, 8% water. Cheers. a fellow, little Englishman, slightly homesick in Paris. He gets a bit, a bit high. And his mind begins to work. And he goes to a house of what is loosely termed ill repute. Puts down a hundred pounds and he said, I would like to spend a night with the ugliest woman that you have. And the madam said, but monsieur, for 100 pounds, you could have the most beautiful of the ladies. He said, I, I don't want to make love, I'm just homesick. <laughs> we, we live, for some reason, have you noticed how aggressive people are becoming today? People are much more aggressive nowadays than they used to be. I mean, it's even walking down the road nowadays, you say good morning to somebody and they grab you and say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Everybody seems to be aggressive. You get in the train. I was sitting in the train a couple of weeks ago. And there's a very large lady in one seat 
some people standing and a man sitting down and she leant across and she said if you were a gentleman you would stand up and let one of those ladies sit down and he said if you were a lady you'd stand up and let them both sit down <laughs> The aggressiveness actually comes out in, in, in drivers. You put a nice, gentle, kind fellow behind the wheel of a car, and suddenly he's a cross between a werewolf, Mr. Hyde, and Harvey Smith. <laughs> and I tell you, if you're ever driving, and there's somebody aggressive about, just wait by the lights when they're red. Sit on the inside lane and sit there, and wait until they draw up on the outside sit there and hold your wheel and rev your engine and go hum. 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 I guarantee you in 10 seconds he is looking at you going hum. Hum. he's thinking you're going to try and get away at the lights before I hum. Hum. take your foot off go two feet he's across the road The one thing, actually, that puts a man above animals is his power to reason, to use his brain, and to use his ingenuity. And in actual fact, we are surrounded by examples of man's ingenuity. If you even take the television set, when you think of the years and time that Bird put into the development and the invention of the television set, and after years of struggling and striving, he eventually got a picture. And he called his wife into the room and he said, look at that. And she said, yes, very nice. What's on the other side? <laughs> and Bell, with his invention of the telephone, he invented the telephone and it was no good until he invented the second telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and then he invented the third telephone. And then he rang the second one and it was engaged. <laughs> Even, even when you think of things like false eyelashes. That's ingenious. I don't know if you've come across them. I was in a bathroom for ten minutes trying to kill one of the bloody things. <laughs> but the pinnacle of man's ingenuity, I suppose, is in what we call transplants. And there will come a time, and we have transplants, basically, to prolong our life. And I suppose it will come to the time where we can transplant every part of the human body and nobody will die. Where are they going to get the spare parts from? <laughs> the fellow who wants a brain transplant. And the surgeon said, I have two brains. Here I have two brains. This is the brain of a psychiatrist. This is the brain of a politician. The psychiatrist's brain is 300 pounds. The politician's is 1,000 pounds. And the man said, does that mean that the, the politician's brain is greater? He said, no, it has never been used. <laughs> Nasty, that. <laughs> so far this evening, we've looked for humor in various guises and different periods of time. But what about modern humor? Well, I suppose a modern humor reflects very much on the modern problems of living. For example, you get the year 2020, you get the Prime Minister of England at a reception, meets the President of the United States, and they decide to have a cocktail. And the man behind the bar says, I will make you a cocktail, sir, that will blind your eyes out. And he puts the booze in, and he begins to shake it. Prime Minister of England looks at the President of the United States and he said, I don't like white people, but they do have rhythm. <laughs> well, you get the tourist in Israel arrives at the Sea of Galilee. 
and there's a notice to say motorboat tour the Sea of Galilee and he goes to the man and he said uh, how long does the uh, tour of the Sea of Galilee take in the boat and the fellow said ten minutes and he said how much is it he said a hundred dollars he said a hundred dollars for ten minutes I'm not surprised Jesus walked <laughs>